Researchers once were wanting to figure out what type of influence that hope would have on people who were suffering particular amounts of hardship. And so what these researchers did was they took two sets of laboratory rats and they had two big tubs of water and they put one set of rats in one tub just to see what would happen. And within an hour, every one of those rats had drowned. In the other tub of water, they placed the second set of rats and every so often, they would take them out and then put them right back in immediately. And then after another little while, they would take them out and put them right back in. And what they found was while that first set of rats, who they just put in and left, drowned within an hour, that other set of rats swam in that tub of water for 24 hours before they finally just took them out for good. Now, now what was the difference in that experiment? The difference was that that second set of rats, they didn't swim that long because they, had kept, they, they kept receiving that small amount of rest because the time they took them out of the water didn't amount to anything. No, the difference was that second set of rats had hope. They had hope that if they swam just a little bit longer, somebody was going to take them out. And so they kept swimming and swimming and swimming, staying afloat as long as they possibly could because they had hope. You know, that's one of the great things that hope will do in our lives. It doesn't matter how bad our lives may be. It doesn't matter what type of situation we may be experiencing. It doesn't matter what type of sorrow we may be enduring. If we have hope as children of God, that hope is going to keep us afloat as long as we need it to. What a beautiful and wonderful blessing to life hope is. To some, though, it is the ever-elusive blessing. It's that blessing they seem anyway to keep chasing and chasing and chasing, and yet they never really feel as though they can grasp it. There are some, though, who, with whom hope seems to be ever-present, always springing eternal as it is. And when we look at those two sets of people like we looked at those two sets of rats, we might ask the question, what is the difference? Uh, the difference is when it comes to you and me as human beings, as to whether we have hope or whether we don't, it comes down to this primary factor. The perception and reception of Jehovah God into our lives. Now, how is it that we can know that? Somebody might say, well, isn't that just a tall tale? Isn't that just something that you might have experienced, but you can't really apply to anybody else? No, that's what the Bible says. In Titus 2, beginning in verse 11, you remember <coughs> the Apostle Paul writing that the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for what? For that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. The difference as to whether we have hope or don't is the presence of God in our lives. How is it, though, that we can not only look for that hope, but how is it that we can receive such a hope that will get us through the most trying and depressing of times in life? 
Well, in those four verses, Paul indicates three key essential ideas of how we in our lives can look for the same blessed hope of which he wrote that will allow us to endure through the trials and temptations and troubles that will confront us in life. And so what are those three essential ingredients to find the blessed hope of which Paul speaks? Number one, in Titus chapter 2, I believe you have Paul telling us that we must first follow God's ways. You remember in Galatians chapter 5 when Paul gave that great comparison and contrast between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. And in beginning in verse number 16, he said, leading up into that contrast, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. You know, if we allow the pleasure centers of our bodies to make decisions for us on a daily basis, we would be in a heap of trouble. We cannot allow decisions in our lives to simply be made based on what will most pleasure myself. Because to do that is to give credence to the flesh and to deny the spirit. No, Paul said to not live after the flesh, but rather to walk after the Spirit. The flesh alone is going to respond contrary to the direction of the Spirit. And therefore, we have to recognize there is a much higher and greater way that we need to be following. What is that way? Go back to Titus chapter 2 and look at verse 12 where Paul said, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now, friends, to me, it appears as though Paul is saying, you want that blessed hope? You want to look for it? Do you want to obtain it? There's something required of you. You need to be willing to deny self and follow the ways of God Almighty. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust. Putting away those things that are not of the Father, but are of the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. John said, abstain from them because they are not of the Father, but they are of the world. Paul says, deny them. Purge your life free from them. Get as far away from them as you can. You remember what Peter wrote in 1 Peter 5, 8 with regard to our adversary, the devil, that we need to be sober and vigilant because as a roaring lion, he walks about seeking whom he may devour. James would write, if you will... Resist the devil, what will happen? He will flee from you. You see, life really is in some ways that simple. Now, resisting sin, I understand, is a difficult thing at times. But the concept of what I must do to follow the ways of God is not difficult at all. It's quite simplistic. To follow the ways of God is a two-fold process. Number one... (coughs) First, I must deny those things that are contrary to what God expects and wants for me. Denying ungodliness. Those things that are anti-God. Those things that are contrary to His will. Because what ultimately is sin going to do for us? This is, the, this is the thing. Sin will do nothing for you. Now, is that the message that the world preaches? Oh, absolutely not. The world tells us sin does something for us. 
But I guarantee I could sit every one of you down individually, myself included, and we could go through every single sin that you've ever committed, that I have ever committed in life, and upon close examination, let's answer this question together. Has a single sin committed in life ever done anything for you? And the answer to which we must come is no. Sin has never done a single thing for us. But you know what it has done? While sin has never done anything for you, it has done plenty to you. Sin has separated you from your God, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Sin has caused you to be separated from Him here and ultimately outside of penitence and obedience to the gospel that sin will cause us to be separated from Him eternally. Romans chapter 6. It's going to cause death. Sin causes heartache and sorrow. It causes sleepless nights and broken families. Sin is nothing but trouble. And it's never done a thing in the world for you, but it's still doing plenty to you. Do we want to be recipients of that blessed hope? Number one, Paul says, you need to get out of the sinning business. You need to deny ungodliness and worldly lust in order to do what? Number two, live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world, in this moment, in this time. Don't wait. Don't delay. Don't put it off. Don't hesitate. The devil's message is wait. Put it off. You've got plenty to do right now. There's no need to deny yourself those things that you can enjoy now when you can always commit your life to God later. No, Paul said that we need to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, in the present time. Because while sin has done plenty to us, God will do everything for us. He'll bless us. He'll give us the opportunity to be His children. He'll forgive us of our sins and ultimately He'll save us in heaven forever. That's the hope that we as Christians can have that will bless us immeasurably. But it will require of us following after the ways of God, not after our own ways, but after God's ways. Remember what Solomon said in Proverbs 10 and verse 28? The hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. That's the contrast. The righteous man has hope. And in that hope is gladness, joy. Just like the eunuch experienced in Acts 8 and verse 36 when after Philip had been called away, after the eunuch's obedience, what did he do? He went on his way rejoicing. Why? Because there was gladness in his hope. But the expectation of the wicked will perish. It will bring death and destruction, eternal torment. You want hope? Follow God's ways and you'll never go wrong. Number two, not only in Titus 2 does Paul say that we must follow God's ways. Second, he says that we must focus on God's Word. How else shall we know of God's ways outside of having studied and knowing and meditating on the Word of God? James 1, beginning in verse 18, James wrote, Of his own will begat he us with the Word of truth that we should be a kind of firstfruits of His creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness, 
superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness what the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Now, what word can we know James 1, 27, or James 1, uh, 22 refers to? Well, Paul had earlier discussed in Romans 1, 16 that it's the gospel that's able to save our souls. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. If it's the gospel of God that's able to save our souls in Romans 1, 16, then the engrafted word in James 1, 22 that's able to save our souls is the word of God as well. And James says you have to receive that word into your life with meekness, humility, piety. And as being recipients of the engrafted word, we must, verse 22, be doers of that word and not hearers only. James, how is it then that I can bring the Word of God into my focus? Well, James says, number one, you have to receive that Word. Hear it, study it, know it, meditate on it. But, but is that all, James, that I have to do to focus my attention and my life on that Word? No, because James then adds that second step to be not just hearers of the Word, but to be doers of the Word. A discussion he would carry on into chapter 2 when he discussed the great relationship that exists between faith and works, obedience, activity, in response to that Word. Now go back to Titus 2 and look at the beginning of verse 12. Where in order to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present world, what first must occur, Paul? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present world. What, what Paul? What do we then have to do? We have to be taught. Hope is acquired through instruction. It is a blessing that is first taught to us and then received unto our lives. And specifically, Paul is citing instruction in the holy Word of God which itself is able to make us holy according to His will. You remember in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 15, where Paul, in commendation of young Timothy, mentioned that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which is able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Why is Paul able to commend Timothy? Because he said that from your youth, from a young age you had been taught and you have known. Your attention in life has been focused on the holy scriptures of God which in turn made you holy upon your reception and your obedience to that word. Well, that's the same thought that's presented throughout the Bible Particularly in the book of Psalms, you have any number of references to the purifying, hope-filling nature of the Word of God. For instance, Psalm 119 and verse 49, the psalmist wrote that we should remember the Word. Remember the Word unto thy servant, upon which thou hast caused me to hope. That's a statement made from the writer to God. God, remember the word that you gave to your servant, the word that gave your servant hope. I think if anybody throughout the Bible could appreciate God-given hope, it was David. David faced some, some very rocky times in his life. And he needed the hope of God as much as anybody to get him through. And here he's saying, God, remember the word 
of hope that you gave to your servant because it's that word that allowed me to sustain. Psalm 119 verse 81. My soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. Regardless of what's going on in the world around us, we know that as children of God, in the Word of God, we can have hope. And how many times of distress have we turned to the comforting and soothing words of passages like Psalm 23 and found hope? How many times standing around a graveyard... Have we read passages like 1 Corinthians 15 or 1 Thessalonians 4? And from that ash, children of God received hope. Friends, it's in God's Word that we can have the hope that's going to get us through life. Psalm 119 and verse 114, Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in Thy Word. Solomon wrote over in Proverbs that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. That's the same thought David's presenting here in verse 114. You're my hiding place. You're my shield. God, you are the one upon whom I can count to protect me. To be my hiding place. To be my shelter from the storm. And the only reason that we can know that we have that hope and that safety with God as our refuge is through His Word which instills within us that hope. Psalm 130 and verse 5, I'll wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait, and in His Word do I hope. Time and time again throughout the Bible, the message is clear if we want hope, our attention must be focused on God's Word as we follow His ways. And number three, as we fulfill God's wants. In Deuteronomy 10 and verse 12, Moses summarized in one key statement the entirety of Israel's responsibility to God in these words. And now Israel... What doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in His ways, and to love Him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all of thy heart and with all of thy soul? One verse, and that is a summary statement of their entire responsibility. If they could truly grasp the full import of that one verse the rest of his law and expectations would have come naturally. Sadly, they did not grasp the full import of that one verse. And the reality of God's law evaded them throughout their history. But by submitting themselves under his will and fulfilling his wants, their requirement, their responsibility would have been satisfied. And the fullness of His blessings would have been bestowed upon them. Now, I don't want to read Deuteronomy 10, 12 and leave the impression that God was merely expecting of His people some type of mechanical obedience. Here's my law, do it. I don't care what you think, I don't care what you feel. You just mechanically do my law and everything's going to be just fine. That's not what He's saying because look at the clarifying remarks. Fear the Lord thy God, walk in His ways, and love Him, serving Him with all your heart and with all of your soul. He's not asking for mechanical obedience. He is asking for heartfelt, love-filled, motivated obedience. Back to Titus 2, look at verse 14. Of Christ... Paul wrote, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto us, or unto himself, a peculiar people zealous of good works. Reading that verse, I cannot help but be reminded of 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 15, where Paul wrote, 
of Stephanus and his great household who he identified with what key characteristic? I love the way he words this. Who are addicted to the ministry of the saints. What a great statement to be made about someone. If that was the only thing that could be written on someone's tombstone, I think that would be enough. He was addicted to the ministry of the saints. Friends, that should be a key characteristic that we should all be seeking to emulate in our lives with the reality that it is that addiction or lack thereof that will either allow us to receive this blessed hope or whether it shall remain eternally obscure from our lives. We must be so heavily concentrated in our lives on the will of God and His service that we do not have time for the foolishness of this world. Our time is used up. Our energy is used up. Our resources are used up in service to God. That is how we fulfill God's wants. By turning our lives, our bodies, our every being over to Him as a living sacrifice. So that we can sing songs such as, I am mine no more. I am mine no more. I've been bought with blood. I am mine no more. Friends, unless our lives are a living sacrifice in every conceivable way, in fulfilling the wants of God, then we cannot honestly sing such a song. But as our lives are turned over in service to Him, then our lives are a perfect reflection of just such a thought. Psalm 78 and verse 7, the psalmist wrote, psalmist wrote that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. Now, friends, I think at the end of the day, that must be what our expectation is as well. To not forget God, to not forget His works, but to perpetually, continually keep His commandments. For is that not the sum total of what our lives are to be? In Ecclesiastes, Solomon set out to ask this great question. With what purpose do I live? His concluding remark, fear God, keep His commandment, for this is the whole duty of man. We may ask ourselves this question today. With what purpose do we live? Friends, the answer is not changed. We too must fear God, keep His commandment, for this is our whole duty before God. Have you in your life sought to follow God's ways? Focus on His Word. Fulfill His wants in fear, honor, and reverence to the God of heaven. That's the God-given formula for how we can achieve such a blessing of hope in our lives. Are you looking for it? Are you grasping for it? Are you chasing it? Well, it doesn't elude you today. You can have it. If you'll come, taking that step in obedience to God and your life and turning yourself over to Him. Have you done that this morning? If you're not a child of God, why not make the decision this morning while you still have time and opportunity to end faith Believing Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, repent of your sins. Confess that faith openly and publicly before us. And upon that confession of faith, be immersed in water to have your sins washed away. He'll add you to His church. He'll redeem you of your sins. He'll adopt you into His family. And you can have that this morning. Maybe you've done all that in the past, but you've allowed the world to come between you and God. You've allowed the, the flesh to begin making decisions that the Spirit should be making. 
And this morning you recognize the, the faults that are present in your life and the need that you have to respond and to take care of them while there's still time and opportunity, looking for that blessed hope. Why not do that this morning? Repenting of your sin, confessing it, praying unto God for forgiveness. And He'll instill with you that hope by the cleansing power of the blood of His Son, with which He will forgive you, cleanse you of all of your unrighteousness, and remember your sins and your iniquities no more. Do you want that blessed hope? Are you looking for it? Do you want to obtain it? You can do it today, even now, if you'll come, while together we stand and sing.